Welcome to Between the Vines. This is Kevin Martin, and I'm here again with Jennifer Phillips Russo. Good morning. Good morning. It's good to be back with you again this week. Uh, we're going to cover a bunch of things this morning. Uh, one of the first things will be the picture behind Jennifer. Uh, we're also going to cover how wrong we were last week. We're going to blame the weatherman for that. We've got some upcoming meetings and some events and a few more sort of just current events and, and updates that we wanna give you to make sure you've got all the information you need to get started because uh, we're about to get rolling growing season wise. So there's there's a lot of stuff coming up. Uh, and uh, Jennifer, I think that's probably what you wanna cover in terms of the beginning of the growing season. Yeah, so as you can see behind me, this was taken at the Cornell Lake Erie Research and Extension Laboratory in Portland, New York. These are our research vines that we're on at Agritech. This is a Concord vine and it's a little bit further out than we would like this week. I'm not gonna say that we officially called bud break yet because we have to wait for those official emails to come out from the research team. However, we did call 10% pink. 10% pink was called on April 10th, which is a little bit earlier than it normally is. And we're gonna wait till we're 50% pink to officially call bud break. I think that that probably has already happened, maybe yesterday or the day before, but I need official word yet. Either way, it's a bit earlier than the average 45 year history. So let me just take you to where you can find that information. If you're interested, I will share my screen in a moment. So is that picture behind you from the phenology block? This picture behind me is not the phenology block. However, it is the next block over. There's only headlands between them. Okay. Because, I mean, I'm just looking at that picture, and it looks actually like maybe you're a little past. That's why uh, I'm just waiting for the there, official so. word. That's why I said it's, it was probably right. Wednesday on the 14th, but I just need the official word before I make that, and I don't want to be. Oh, yeah, there. for sure. It just looks like we hit. 10% pink and things were still moving very quickly at that point. I think we're probably slowed down now, but, um, you know, we can, we pretty rapidly went from that modified Shawless field score of 2.5 to three and potentially maybe even a little bit beyond in some locations. Right. So that 10% pink is 3.0 on the modified Shawless field score. It's right here on the lergp.com website. For those of you who are listening for just the audio and not the video, you can go to lergp.com, do it on your phone when you're out in your vineyard blocks and check the modified Shawless field score against your buds in your own block. But we're, we are giving you what the research finds say at our location as a general of what's going on. Sorry, my mail keeps popping up. So full swell is 3.0. And like you said, I think we're a little bit past that, but you can go on. Here's that modified Shawless field score. And then right below it is the historical phenology. Can you see that? Probably super Not tiny. Not really at all. Uh, so I mean, this is just a sort of an Excel table of when we reach bud break in past years. But it's gone all the way back to 1965 for most of the data that we collect. Starting 1979, we have bud break on there. And since the average since 1979 is May 5th when we've had called bud break. Like I said, I can't officially call it, but you can see by the picture behind me that it probably was called around the 14th. We'll wait and get that out to you as soon as possible. Yeah, so yeah, so we're looking at about a three or four week, uh, three or four weeks almost of extra risk. Um, yeah. Unfortunately, I think we talked about this last week, things weren't too vulnerable a week ago. The weather forecast when we actually recorded this podcast indicated that there was going to be a cool down and we were hoping everything would pause at where were we one and a half two i think we were at two then yeah. i don't quite remember i just know that we were all nervous because we were seeing pink and yeah. we wanted it to slow down and then it was just beautiful <laughs> i mean to be honest i was a little bit optimistic but the weather forecast was just plain wrong we had a beautiful weekend like you said i think humans enjoyed it grapes enjoyed it but now we're you know as grape growers, it's a little worrisome since everything sort of blew through that dormancy and well into we're vulnerable now. I know I have a lot of growers who are not a lot, a handful of growers who have called me and said they are just tired of farming for crop insurance. They just want to farm for grapes. 
but just I mean it can be exhausting to to go through this period I think for a lot of growers because there's not a lot you can do we could talk a little bit about what you can do um we've actually had a lot of really good luck with crop insurance or with farming in the last decade yeah what not year was it where we were like this close and then it was a beautiful season and the crop was huge I mean honestly my biggest concern is that grape prices were low while crop insurance prices were high so the the amount you were insured for yields average yields were also very high so some growers may have reduced the amount of insurance that they carry which is not so bad but many growers may have eliminated crop insurance altogether which is a much bigger concern so they were insured for much more than their average crop was worth so if they made some adjustments if you guys made some adjustments and you didn't adjust back to higher prices for 2020 because now we do have high prices that it's it, crop insurance is going to be less effective than it could be so my big concern is crop insurance looked really expensive five years ago but from the perspective of farming for crop insurance there was a little bit of that last year but very little um, most people had an okay crop and they got a the people who did get a claim a lot of them got a claim and a crop because their averages were so high and for a lot of growers they still are high so this is not i mean we had a few years in there especially you know hybrid growers but also concord growers where it was one claim after another and your average yields start to dwindle and it's not an effective form of risk management and you really are just every other year farming for crop insurance but I mean, it really hasn't been that way for the last 10 years. And well, I am an optimist and I'm going to pray that the weather stays cooler now and that you guys take care of your middle rows, mow them down, keep them as low as possible for that drainage and hope for the best. I mean, we cool. have a cool, we have cooler weather now, so hopefully it'll just slow things down for a little bit. Glyphosate's an option too, you know, if it's a time period when you can apply that, but you guys know how glyphosate works and you know, lower temperatures, you may risk, you may risk that not being very effective, depending. So you got to really work on your timing there. I, I would think that glyphosate might actually be more effective than mowing uh, in terms of temperature. True. Um, disking was a historical option. And, you know, I, I think some people still swear by it. The data does support the fact that temperatures improve. There is more air drainage, there's more surface area to warm the soil, but it's just a disaster. I mean, we're trying to do everything mechanized that we can. We're trying to improve soil health and it just undermines everything except for frost protection. I, it's it not does. I, it's I cringe. Excessive. I cringe when you hear that. It's just, you know? Yeah, I cringe too. For, you know, you have your thoughts on soil health and I have my thoughts on how much it costs to disc a vineyard and then potentially repair it. Um, so you know, if I was a really small grower growing something extremely high value, I think there is, it is a, it is a thing you could consider. But for our Concord Niagara guys, it just messes everything up. And honestly, look how beautiful they are. You drive around the belt and I see this pink hue going. I know it's, we can't stop it. It's here. So let's just Embrace there is a lot of good information and potentially new products on delaying bud break in March. Uh, we've had some information through Penn State, a webinar about that. That's not, yeah, we're, we're past when you would use those products. That's why the webinar was when it was and you, you've missed it. Um, but something to consider going forward in the long term for your strategy. Uh, we do have some growers that use wind turbines to fight air inversions. The larger they are, the more I believe that they're effective. The small ones that you tow behind a tractor that might be effective on a whole acre or not, I'm, I'm not so sure about those. But, you know, I those, those do have a very positive ROI if you get the frost event close to when they're new. Very hard to do that. So probably something that should be reserved for high yielding vineyards when there isn't a frost. So very good sites other than the fact that they're in a site that's more, uh, has a higher probability than most sites of an inversion event. And we have those sites and a couple of those sites do have the, that technology and it's been pretty effective when you can use it often enough. Mm -hmm. 
but we don't well, have a lot of options and crop insurance is for the most part, the most simple option. Well, since we are here at the growing season, I'm sure now people are gonna start thinking about what are we doing for our plan, our spray plan moving forward? Do you see what I did here with this little segue? I are do. Picking up yeah, so I'm let's talk down? about some of the meetings we've got coming up. <laughs> so I just also wanna state, and I'm gonna share my screen again because there is a lot of information on our website and we also give it to you in our crop updates and our newsletters. But if you don't just reach out and call us and ask for it, I just want you to know where you can find it on our website. So I'm gonna share my screen again and go back to the website. For those of you who are listening, it's lergp.com. And as soon as you type in lergp.com and scroll down, for those of you who are viewing, this purple button right here that says events, you're going to click right on that and it's going to show you the very first one that pops up is this 2021 pest management spray schedule. What is your plan? Really happy to be bringing this to you. It's actually next week, April 21st, 2021. It's gonna be from 10 a.m. till 12, and it's gonna be run by Andy Musa and Brian Head of Penn State. Andy is a team member of the LERGP, and we work very closely with Brian Head, who is a research technologist at plant pathology. I'm happy to say that you can get two New York State DEC pesticide recertification credits for it and four PDA credits for it. So we do have credits available. You have to register and there's a cost for this program of $10. That's because we are get, being able to offer you those credits this year. And if you see this register here and click on it, it, takes you right to the registration link. You have to register to attend the meeting. Once you do that, it'll send you the link to join. It is a virtual meeting. Everything is virtual right now. Unfortunately, we cannot meet in person on campus just yet and Clarel is considered considered campus. Yeah, you'll notice that um, we asked for a little bit of extra information. If you do attend coffee pot meetings or did last year, you're pretty familiar with that. It's very similar. So we do wanna make sure you get your credits. So that's what that's for. That's why we ask a few extra questions. Um, I should state that when we're in that meeting, sorry to interrupt you, sure, we will sure. be going yeah. over the viticulture planning calendar that we gave out to all of our growers. So it kind of correlates with the New York State and Pennsylvania pesticide guidelines. So we'll be using both of those tools going back and forth, talking about the materials that are out there, when you should spray at what phenological stage and any questions that you guys have, we'll be there to answer it. And Kevin, you'll be there for economics. Yeah, um, before I get to that, if you're not a member and you want a calendar, you can buy it on our website. Uh, if you become a member, I assume we're going to do a calendar next year. So that'll be available to you as part of your membership, as far as I know. Um, but uh, the other thing I, yeah, I, I want to spoil that meeting a little bit. So there's going to be a lot of discussion about materials and strategies. There's a lot of, uh, you know, it's not as simple as it once was where you spray the yellow stuff three times and you're good to go. Uh, the recommendations of extension are infinitely more complex. A lot of that has to do with the fact that we have kinder, gentler insecticides and pesticides. So they're targeting specific things. You know, we have a lot of things right now that just target powdery mildew or just target uh, downy mildew. So things are more complicated and we're, we're here to help you work through that. It's going to be a very important year to do that right. Uh, if you do have a full crop this year, it's going to be all signs point to the fact that it's going to be worth a lot of money and your crop losses will cost you more than they normally do. So an increase in your crop protection strategy through disease management is going to make a lot of sense. So you might be using new chemistries or materials you haven't used before. We don't know for sure what is going to happen, but certainly by the 21st of April, we might know more. So we're going to try to tailor some of those recommendations based on what's going on in the vineyard. Um, you know, if there is a frost event, your strategy is going to look a lot different because your crop losses are unfortunately going to look a lot different if, if half of your crop is already gone. But it won't be, I hope. I was like, um, <laughs> I'm just Here's so, me. <laughs> So what I do, the one spoiler I will offer is we don't see a lot of widespread price increases for pesticides that are specific to specialty crops, you know, Vivando, Quintec, uh, things like that, particularly in the powdery mildew market. 
the there's two three percent four percent price increases there related to trucking and inflation and you know the company's trying to do a little bit better for themselves but nothing drastic uh, now when you look at chemicals like roundup that are commonly used in field crops things are a, a world of difference they plummeted in price in october november of last year uh, I, I don't want to upset anybody who forgot to buy supplies earlier or don't normally do that, you know, because you might have missed out on these prices. But, you know, Roundup was $9 an acre when you were buying it in bulk. And we're up to $16 an acre now uh, on Roundup. And that's good news because a lot of the other chemicals dipped in price and are no longer available because the response of increasing prices was just too slow and demand outstripped the supply. So right now there are things that just aren't available. We are, and the chemical companies are hopeful that they will be able to supply the needs of the industry. I don't know what those prices are gonna look like realistically. They could be fine or they could be much higher. We really just don't know. What's driving that right now is the price of corn. So the yeah. price of corn was fairly low last fall. And when it became very clear that the supply of corn was inadequate, uh, that changed. So corn right now was approaching six dollars. It's five seventy five. Local corn has a, a sixty cents added to basis for future contracts for this year's coming harvest. Um, so that puts us very close to six dollar corn in the area, and over five dollars uh, for close yesterday of of um, regular future contracts. So that's expensive corn. They're going to spend more money maintaining that crop for the same reason you should your grapes. I was uh, just going to say, so what does corn have to do with grapes? Right. So so all of those, what we call inexpensive uh, fungicides and herbicides that we buy in bulk, those are typically the ones that get used in field crops like corn. And they are the ones that are unavailable or significantly more expensive like Roundup is. So your decisions of prices will be a little bit more complicated you may be trading up to materials that are better suited to specialty crops because they're available and the the price gap is going to be different because well, we're going to hear all about this stuff at the spring absolutely meeting. yeah i want to make sure that everybody involved in talking about those chemicals like andy musa and brian head get their fair shot at discussing all those chemicals so we'll do a little bit of a spoiler on the trends and the pricing <laughs> so that that is that um get them and, hard first and then boost them up later and <laughs> and the very good news is great prices do look healthy so you guys can afford those it's not fun i mean it's better if you can just make more money but but because prices are high none of these changes in inputs are adjusting our recommendations for what you do in the vineyard yet so i'm glad that we can bring you that program next week Next week, April 21st, from 10 to 12 a.m., you can get two New York State pesticide recertification credits in four Pennsylvania if you need them. Also, spread the word. You don't have to be a member to be a part of this. If you know other people who are looking for credits, let them know and they can join the meeting as well. Remember yeah, open meeting for sure. You know, if you're just catching this podcast, check out our website. You can join the program, you no matter where you're from, but you can certainly learn a whole lot about grapes and uh, check out this. Uh, this program if you need some credits. Yeah, <clears throat> excuse me. This kind of actually segues us into a really nice discussion about our newsletter that went out. Absolutely. Our newsletter this week or this month went out because of Professor Katie Gold. Yeah, Professor Katie Gold, I don't know if you are familiar with her work. I, I don't think she's been with Cornell long enough to avoid COVID. Is that correct? She has not been in her office yet. Right. That's what I thought. So you may not be familiar with the name because she certainly hasn't been to one of our conferences because she hasn't had one, but she has filled the shoes of Dr. Wayne Wilcox. Well, I should go back way. and say that she has been with us, but she is doing, she was doing a postdoc with NASA, still working with us. And then also COVID hit. So she's not been in her office. <laughs> right. Right. So if you take a look at our newsletter, you will see something similar to what our growers used to rely on, what you guys used to rely on with uh, what we called Wayne's Opus, because I think right before his retirement, it hit maybe 85 pages. Uh, and it was, you know, the Bible of disease control. This is a little bit different. She's taking her own approach. I, I kind of like it in, in a way. 
you know, we have a lot of very experienced growers and what this gets you is something a lot more digestible. It's still not short. Uh, it's, you know, I think it's 28 pages or something like that. 20, it's 24 because I know I wanted to print it. <laughs> okay. But it really highlights the changes this year um, where they're gathering efficacy data on newer products, where they uh, have recently published full efficacy data, you know, what, what label changes are significant for the industry this year. So um, I don't want to go through all 24 pages, but I do want to say one thing super relevant to our Concord growers is the material Sevia, which has been out for a couple of years. It's a DMI, which if you forgot, is an old uh, FRAC 3 that doesn't work particularly well in Concords anymore. There's definitely um, powdery, you know, most of the DMIs slipped on powdery mildew control. So their use was pretty much abandoned, I think. Um, certainly by the growers I talked to, it was abandoned, but Sevia is a lot like Revis Top. Uh, it's, even though it's a DMI, it's very effective. So the good news is it's also safe for use in Concords in 2022. They did it, Brian Head did a lot of trial work on it. They thought it might be safe, uh, but the current label does not allow for its use in natives but it, it will be allowed in 2022. And for 2021, it was labeled in New York. So this is the first year it's available in New York. And next year, it will be an option for our Concord and Niagara growers. Just um, another tool in the toolbox, which is great. Yeah, it's really nice to have that tool. I think a lot of growers were happy with Revis Top where they could use it. Very unhappy when they damaged some Concords the first year it was out. Um, and very nice to see Brian Head's work in making sure that this label did change because I think the company was really, you know, not super interested in the Concord market. I think they were just very reluctant. They wanted to see a lot of data to make sure it was safe because I Revis Top cost a lot of money for those chemical companies to repair because they missed that. And um, this this is another tool. This is a great tool. There's a lot of other stuff in there. I think you guys want to check out. Um, but you'll have to check it out on your own. We're not going to cover 24 pages here. I just want to make sure oh, you, you're ever. aware of Semia. Yeah. <laughs> we However, have been what? approved for our virtual coffee pot meetings this year again, and it we is well received last year when we had special guest speakers. So Dr. Katie Gold has already agreed to do one of our early May guest, guest speaker spots, and she's going to talk about her paper that she just released. So if you want to read through it and write down your questions and ask her personally, please join us for that coffee pot. Excellent. And to jump away from disease control a little bit, but stay on the newsletter, uh, there are instructions to listen to this podcast, which is now actually a podcast. Uh, if you can see my face right now, technically that's a video blog. Um, this not has been a vote be of contention pedantic. with Kevin for a very not long time. Not to be pedantic, <laughs> but... <laughs> um, no, what we really want to do is make sure that you can access this information in any way that's easy for you. So the video blog is not going away. If that's your thing, continue to use it. If you hate the video blog and you want to keep using our newsletter and crop update, do that. Um, however, if you spend a lot of your time in the tractor and you know you have a cab and access to audio and a smartphone, more and more of our growers fall into that camp. And some of them already listen to podcasts. So we're there as well. Um, if you are interested in listening, but you're not familiar with podcasts, you can find those instructions in our newsletter. We've got instructions for an Apple device and we have instructions for an Android device. Uh, one big thing is there, Apple has an, a native app for podcasts. So you don't actually have to install an app on your phone if you have an iPhone, it's already there. You just have to open it up and search for Between the Vines and click the Penn State logo. If you're on Android, you've got to figure out what podcast app you want to use, download it, and then do the same thing. And there are some more specific instructions in the newsletter. They're also on our website. Um, I'm showing the website right now for those yeah. who are watching the video. Now, blog. the only caveat I have is Google does have a native app that's fairly new. Uh, so if you have a newer Android device, you might already have a podcast app built in in Google Podcast. We are not listed on Google Podcasting yet. Um, we are listed on almost all of the other apps that are accessible to Google or Android users. So you can find us that way as well. And we'll let you know when we're on uh, Google Podcast. It'll take a couple of weeks. Um, 
In the meantime, you can also stream it. Go ahead. In the meantime, you can also stream it from our website. If you just go to our lergp.com, on the top there, there's a tab that says resources. The very first one is podcasts. Click on that and it'll bring you up to the seasons that are there. There's a button right on the homepage too. Um, And if you're- Subscribe. Yeah, if you're streaming this video, that's right below those podcasting links now. So that was our, that was where we- just had videos before so if if jennifer had just scrolled down a little bit more oh here let me go that's back. where you get the video blog as you always he's have so bossy and sometimes no 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 see there you go um <laughs> so this probably looks a little more familiar if you're seeing us now this is probably where you found us uh the subscribe button also provides some instructions on how to subscribe it's a very good tool for an android device uh, less so for Apple. It's a lot easier in an Apple product to just open up that podcast app that's already installed on your phone and search for Between the Vines. The subscribe button on our website, that's going to help you a lot if you have an Android device. Lots of new things If you have any questions, away. especially if you're a member, feel free to reach out directly and we can walk you through that if you're interested. You yeah. know, if you already listen to podcasts, then this is definitely a good tool for you. If, if you don't, but you really miss hearing us on the go, give it a try and see if you can figure it out and we can definitely help you with that and if there's anything that you want us to actually talk about like if you have questions and you feel like some of your grower relations might also have questions shoot it for us we'll look it up and at least get a podcast out there for you absolutely so i also wanted to say you see the buds behind me i know i'm not a little ray of sunshine today i have one other piece of news that was put out there I'm going to share my screen again, and I'm cringing as I'm thinking about it. This was in, for those of you who are listening and not viewing it, this was in the Ithaca Voice, and you can go to IthacaVoice.com. Kevin, what do you see there? It says road closed ahead. So I guess a road is closed in Ithaca. There's a road closed in Ithaca. Let me tell you why there's a road closed in Ithaca. Here on Between the Vines, we talk traffic issues. We do. So there was spotted lanternfly. We all know that there was spotted lanternfly found, egg mass found last fall in Ithaca, New York. Well, they actually found an infestation. And they the 700 block, I'm just going to read it for those who are not lit, watching. The 700 block of Stewart Avenue will be closed to through traffic for several days as the city and state crews work to remove trees infested with the invasive spotted lanternfly. It's uh, April 15th. There's no spotted lanternfly. What are you talking about? They found numerous egg masses on this block on these trees. Ah, And they're trying to get rid of the egg masses before it turns into something huge out there in Ithaca. Because there are at least 30 to 50 eggs in each case and these trees are loaded with them. So they were able to find probably thousands of eggs that look like we like you said 30 to 50 in these little muddy i mean they look like a little chunk of mud yeah i'm going to try to pull it up really quick new york state ipm spotted lantern fly cuz that's where you want to go and i highly suggest you become really familiar with it if you aren't already and i know we had tim weigel and he was the state person in ipm for spotted lantern fly but I really feel like you should, we should push this website more and you should know the life cycle and what you're looking for. So I'm actually going to pull up life cycle. Man, emails are just coming in on a Friday. So this is a Cornell resource for spotted lantern fly to show the life cycle on, what was the website again? IPM? This is New York State NYS IPM. So New York State Integrated Pest Management. And I don't know if you can see, can you see my mouse? Is it big enough there? Yeah, yeah. That's what they look like. Now I know many of you are familiar with the gypsy moth egg sacs. They tend to be more spongy. Which this ones? is gypsy moth tend to okay. be more spongy and these are definitely hard, like cemented look to them. That definitely looks like dried mud. And they're well, so- I was gonna pretty. say, those almost look like egg masses that are a little more fresh in that picture. Right. Because so they turn, turn more gray kind of over time. Marble, That's a lighter. Like a, they turn almost like a woody, muddy brown, right? You know, nature is so awesome the way they can right. just hide things like that. So the chances that they're going to cut down all these trees and find most of those egg masses are 
somewhere between zero and almost zero. So the fact that, right, and the fact that we told you they're on trees does not mean that you just look on trees when you're out scouting because they have no preference. They just so happen to find these on these trees in that area. But Penn State University, thank goodness for Penn State University researchers, and I'm so sorry about the quarantine zone in Southeast PA, but we're, I'm thankful that it's been there. We've had a couple years of research so that it, not if, but when it gets to us up here, we have that to guide us in how we're going to take care of it and control. Oh, oh I mean, I, I don't, I don't mean to be a ray of sunshine, but to me, if I was planning and I'm a little risk adverse for Ithaca, when is now? Yes, for Ithaca, when is now? And possibly that's wrong in major agricultural industries. Possibly the population isn't going to be large enough this fall for that, but that would be what I would plan in Ithaca for sure. And I would also be highly cautious in the rest of the state because just because this hasn't happened in Western New York doesn't mean it couldn't. Right. I mean, it will in the next few years, but it may already have this year. We just didn't find a street with egg masses on it because we missed them. I will let you know, though, I had a grower call me, wasn't a grower. I had a community member call me stating that they saw one in Chautauqua County. This is not to alarm you. I went right out there immediately. I didn't find any egg masses. I didn't find any adults, but at least people were looking. So that made me, and especially a community member, not somebody in grapes. There were grapes behind that person's house. I went down, walked the vineyard, walked the edge. I didn't find anything, but I'm glad people are at least becoming aware and trying to figure out what to do if they find it. Yeah, I, I mean, I'm certainly hopeful that this year it won't be a major issue in certainly our region in Western New York and Northern Pennsylvania, but it looks like it continues to get closer and closer. It so it just closer. feels much more inevitable. Know what you're looking at. They don't have a preference just for wood. They lay their egg masses anywhere, rusted metal, plastic, tires. That's what was spread it so quickly. We're hitchhikers. So, I mean, if you are going to Ithaca or Southeast PA, make sure that you check your car, check your truck if you're delivering grapes somewhere before you come back. Just be really diligent about knowing what it is and how to prevent it from getting here as quickly as possible. <laughs> well, and yeah, I mean, as it gets closer, travel gets more and more inevitable and not just industry travel, but just tr travel in general. Right, right. You know, you don't have to be a grape grower to spread it. You could just be a tourist. So... Okay. I guess what I'm really feeling a little bit of doom and gloom about is they found a couple of egg masses in the fall in Ithaca. And then all of a sudden, I mean, they don't lay more egg masses after that, you know what I mean? Like just meant that there's probably more of them. And now they found this whole area that had a whole bunch. So worrisome that they're taking all of the trees out in that area. Right. Yep. So um, it just makes me... Just be on the lookout, please. The oh, one, and I never even told you, if you do happen to find one, do you know what to do? Oh, well, I have no idea. What should I do? <laughs> you need to call the Ag and Markets, New York State Ag and Markets. If you find one, and you can go on their website. You can get information on the IPM website how to do that, but don't let it go. You've got to, you have to call somebody and they send a team out and they do a survey around the area. They are very on top of this because we've learned from Pennsylvania, so... You yeah, I mean, the work. one slightly good piece of news for industry is that you're going to have a, essentially a growing season of warning. So if this is a problem in the Finger Lakes this year, you're going to see them move through their stages. And the research that they found in Pennsylvania is targeting those, those instars is not extremely effective anyway at preventing crop damage you're really going to focus on the adults later in the season so if all these instars are in the news and you keep seeing more and more information information about it sometime in august and september and possibly even post harvest depending on the varieties you're going to have a targeted spray program for those adults right the bad news is that's really not something that's in our business model we no. don't spray then so I so went you out have to, to be ready for that, be ready for that. Like when I went to Southeast Pennsylvania to see the devastation with Heather Leach and follow her around for a day and see all the research that was going on. These bugs are huge. They're over an inch long. And when they land on you, <laughs> I actually jumped when it landed on me because they're little clingers on their legs that help grip. They actually 
go into your skin. You can definitely see them. It's mostly they're coming in from the forest and the tree line and they're affecting those rows that are on the edge of your blocks. The poor farmers that were there were spraying every other day because yes, they kill them. Any, the spray will kill them and they will die. But then another group just comes in from the, tr the tree line. And yeah, I, I mean, I, I think there were some materials that are going to be more effective where we have larger acreage because they have some staying power. But yeah, I mean, we, we're not really accustomed to watching uh, pre-harvest intervals the way you're going to have to for spotted lanternfly. Right. So that's where sometimes those options run out. And that's where you may see some post-harvest spray happening because then obviously you don't have to worry about pre-harvest interval, but you just have to worry about vine health. And that's why you're spraying, which is what they really go after. So that's not going to be, I mean, it's not going to be easy, uh, but. I'm just hoping we're going to have more tools by the time it does get here. Absolutely. So yeah, it's in Ithaca. They're taking trees out. It was uh, in the news yesterday. They've closed down streets so that they can remove spotted lantern fly. Oh. Yay! Let's finish on that. No, let's not. <laughs> let's keep going, actually. <laughs> For sure. Um, I do want to make you aware of one thing, just that in the future, we're gonna, we are going to have some education on a new crop insurance policy. If you're familiar with Tree Fruit Assistance Program, that's a free program. Nobody pays for it. It just comes from USDA when a bunch of your vines die in the winter, if they really die, as you guys well know, not just get injured. Did you uh, say free? Freeze damage, yeah. Oh, I thought you oh, said yeah, free. Yeah, yeah, yeah. This is, uh, Tree Fruit Assistance is a government subsidized program, so there, it is free. There is definitely expenses involved in replacing vines where they don't pay for 100% of it. But this is a little bit different. This would be stacked onto the tree fruit assistance program as a crop insurance program. So you'd be insuring for vine death. I don't, we're going to see if that's going to be a good fit. It's a brand new program. It has been approved. Definitely want to get that information into the hands of growers to see which ones find that it's relevant to their operation and which ones do not. So we'll be doing that this summer. Um, and then hopefully you can make decisions about it in the fall. Kevin, I want to pull, because you were sort of the head of this, so I want to ask you for a little bit of clarification on it. We now have a system, system in place that if you want to receive text message alerts about information going out, you can. Yes. How do you do that? Um, basically, what we need is your, your telephone information, and you can submit that to us the way you normally contact us. Um, so we don't just need your, tele your cell phone number. We need to know who your provider is. So if they do want to receive information via text message, just you contact can do that, for sure. Kept contact you or Kate or myself with their yeah, cell phone we did number a, and their We provider. did a survey. Was it last fall already? Or was it I know it was a while ago. That's why I wanted to bring it to everybody's attention again. Right. A lot of growers responded that they want frequent text messages from us. Um, like more than one a week or more than two a week. So I think we will continue to investigate the best way to deliver those messages and what types of messages we want to deliver. Um, it could be as simple as a podcast alert that there's a new podcast up or a newsletter. Um, but certainly we want to focus on events too to make sure that you don't miss any events so that you're aware of what's happening tomorrow evening or, or whatever. Um, so that's going to be our first thing that we target. But we may use it for more than that just because so many growers really did kind of indicate that it's more effective than email. Well, or I think it's least, quicker. I mean, yeah, gonna... I mean, at least they're happy to receive potentially even one a day. So that's, you know, to me, that's, we're not going to remind you of events every day. We're not going to spam you with that. Do that. <laughs> it's more like, it, you know, it's more like it indicates to me that it's your primary tool for communication. Or bud break. It's mine. So oh. I'm not surprised. <laughs> it's what? It's my primary tool of communication, so I'm not surprised. I, I hate checking email, so it so doesn't. So much time that you go down the rabbit hole because there's so many of them. So exactly, exactly. <laughs> so um, that might be all we have for today. Uh, definitely apologize for the weather, man. Uh, we yeah. were really hoping that things would slow down, and we weren't going to be talking about, um, you know. The potential for frost damage. I was really hoping things would pause, but we are completely and fully vulnerable at this point. And so that's the major takeaway. Any any kind of real cold event is going to cause some damage. Half glass, half glass full. 
Yep. <laughs> You're hoping sure. that it will just stay a little bit cooler. And then we just squeak right through with a beautiful growing season. I mean, yeah, there's definitely some excellent potential here, as there always is when things are early. If you can escape it, you can do, you know, whatever you want with that crop load. Or I shouldn't say whatever you want, but but it's a world of difference when you're early rather than late if you if you do escape these risks. So that's certainly the good news. We I think we all know that as we've gotten earlier and earlier with our bud break over the years. Mm -hmm. So um, if you have any questions about podcasting, you know, if you're if you're watching this video and you know you want to take it with you again make sure you reach out if you need extra help because this is the first podcast you've ever listened to we'd be more than happy to help with that i also would like to reiterate that the fact that we are not allowed on campus and we can't have visitors at Clarel is not stopping me from coming out to your vineyard so if you have questions or if you just want to touch base please reach out to me my cell phone is 716-640-5350 and then our emails, which you all should have. So yeah, same rules for Penn State. I mean, we can, Andy and I can also do site visits where it's necessary. Obviously, Andy's going to be doing some field scouting this year, and hopefully he joins us every couple of weeks with a scouting report. Um, obviously, that's going to be focused on disease and insects, and those aren't active yet, so you're not missing anything just yet. But we're getting close, so maybe next week. Um, but yeah, absolutely. If you need some face-to-face -face time, we are available. We just need to keep things small and distanced. So we're not having general meetings at our facilities, unfortunately, and coffee pot meetings are also gonna continue to be virtual. Right, which is not such a bad thing. I mean, I really wish we were all in person. However, it gives us the opportunity. We already have four guest speakers lined up and get you face-to-face -face time with some researchers that you can actually ask questions and maybe suggest future research. Absolutely, good and bad, good mm -hmm. and bad for sure. We'll see. Things will be different next year, I hope. Maybe I'm saying that last year, though. I'm really being hopeful that things will be different next year. Yeah, it's, right <laughs> now it's really more hopeful than anything else, for sure. And because you never, I mean, I don't think anybody thought we'd still be doing this a year later. But here we are, coming to you virtually from closets. And, and thank you for adjusting with us. I'm so proud of the people who have joined us on virtual platforms. We have this little hand holding in the beginning, but... You just ran with it. So great job. <laughs> yeah, we have not, we certainly have not reached a hundred percent of our audience. No, uh, we have not. Not that I, not that I expected to, but the ones we did reach, um, it was great to see their faces and we hope to see them again this year. I think everybody, you know, university employees, private sector employees, farmers, the whole world is sort of exhausted by the concept of Zoom, but, but absolutely thank you for joining us. We really appreciate it. Um, you know, we're here for you as much as you're here for us. So we really do appreciate you coming out virtually, even though it can be kind of a drag and is not the same as sitting around a vineyard and discussing what's really happening in the real world. So yeah. we'd love to get back out there as soon as we can. And that's exactly what we're going to do. But for now, this we're just going to take advantage of the perks of Zoom and have some some very talented guest speakers provide some extra <laughs> wisdom. Look at you being a ray of sunshine. I do what I can. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks for joining us, everybody. Yeah, thank you for joining us. We will see you next week.